Hey class, today we're continuing in the chapter on political systems, and today's topic in the curriculum is the topic of political systems and war. Uh, now, in this particular section, and just in general in this particular topic, there can be a lot of opinions about war, about the purpose of war, whether or not war can ever be necessary, can ever be justified, just war theory versus pacifism. We're not really going into those topics. It's not really, we're not in an ethics class, so in a sociology class we're more talking about the social impact of war, social theories around why war happens, and particularly how political systems engage in war and try to socialize people uh, during times of war, or maybe even in preparation for war. So today, when we're talking about war and political systems, uh, something that's important to understand in America is that America is a very powerful nation as far as our war capacity is concerned, and America is a very powerful nation economically, which means we can invest a, a sizable chunk of money into our military structure and infrastructure. So we have a strong enough economy that we are able to fund a lot of war research into weapons, into strategy, into tactics. Uh, we're also able to fund a large standing military and we're able to also develop technologies to make uh, our war efforts more successful, to make them uh, more precise. It, by that I mean less likely to cause collateral damage, less likely to injure innocent civilians. Uh, so we are very much invested in defense as our nation. So uh, your book had a stat from 2015 that some of you might find very interesting. But as far as global expenditure, amount of money spent on the military as far as the whole world is concerned, uh, almost a third, it's right around a third, it's about 33% actually, of money spent globally on military is spent by the United States. So we far outpace any other nation. Uh, in fact, I think we more than double, it's like 2.2 times or 2.3 times, we spend more than any other nation in the world on our military. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is obviously we're a powerful nation that makes us a target, right? Another is that being a part of NATO and uh, being a part of UN peacekeeping uh, missions uh, makes us have to fund a lot of our military. Also, uh, keeping up a massive navy with many aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, uh, just nuclear technology in general, and a lot of our aircraft that are either part of the navy uh, or part of the air force. Uh, be because just interesting fact, the uh, second largest air force in the world is the navy, the U.S. Navy. So the air force is the largest air force. The U.S. Air Force is the largest air force in the world, and the second largest air force in the world is the U.S. Navy. Uh, because of aircraft carriers and aircraft on aircraft carriers, and there are a lot of naval pilots. Uh, so we have a lot of things, upkeep, that we have to sustain, a lot of upkeep we have to sustain on aircraft carriers, nuclear subs, on all of those aircraft. Um, and then as far as paying our members of our Army, our Navy, our Air Force, our Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, um, and then funding special forces, keeping up military bases around the world. We've got military bases in a lot of countries around the world, on top of the other things that I mentioned, you know, NATO, UN peacekeeping, things like that. Uh, so we spend a lot of money on our military, um, and some of that goes to fight terrorism around the world. Um, some of that goes to uh, defending our borders. And some of that goes to defending, you know, like uh, patrolling waters to make sure that shipping is safe. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you are old enough to remember some of the problems that happened with piracy around Somalia, the Somali pirates. Uh, there are pirates in the world to this day, and there are groups that will seize ships and ransom their cargo and their crew. So we patrol waters to make sure things like that don't happen. Uh, we also do interdiction missions. 
uh, sometimes where we're patrolling waters for things that shouldn't be going on, particularly the Coast Guard, uh, things that might be coming into our, in, our waters from international waters. So we fund a lot of that through our massive military spending. I think our, our, somewhere around 16% of our national budget um, and our, our budget's about 4.4, 4.5 trillion uh, recently in very recent years. Uh, this year is going to be a bit bigger uh, because of deficit spending uh, for uh, coronavirus funding as far as like stimulus checks and small business protection and things like that. But generally, you know, our budget's 4.4 trillion or so, and we, we're spending about 16% of that on our military. So it's a massive amount of spending. Whereas a lot of other nations may have a lot of military capacity, but they just don't spend nearly as much on it. So America does have a very powerful military, and we do spend a lot on our military. Uh, now, among our populace, there are differing opinions on this. So even among various presidential administrations, this might show a snapshot of the populace. Like, right? Bill Clinton cut military spending. Right? George W. Bush brought it back up and refunded the military. Refunded as in funded again. Uh, Obama cut military, the military down somewhat. And Donald Trump has also added to military spending. Uh, now, I'm, I'm using generalizations. I'm not saying specifically what they, they did. But this happens back and forth among presidential administrations. Uh, so we do see downturns and upturns in military funding because some presidents believe in a smaller military and in less military funding. And some theories are. So there's the peace through strength model which Ronald Reagan uh, is known for championing, which is the idea sociologically, people generally don't try to pick on a strong person. And we've talked about this in class before, uh, but this is something with war and with building up a strong military that some people, uh, when they are socialized right, or are cultured, when they learn culture, they're taught culture, some people are taught in their friend groups, their peer groups, their family groups about peace through strength, which is the idea that if sociologically, and there are interesting studies on this, by the way, there was a very interesting study um, I saw on this where an actor was paid, he was about seven feet tall, and he, I, I don't forget, I forget exactly, he was like 370 or 380 pounds, he's a big man, and he went into places where people were drinking and eating and would take their product. So like if they, if they were drinking something, he would just go by and take a drink of it. Uh, and invariably, the person that this happened to, they would look up angrily. And then they would see this massive man there and they would pretend like nothing happened. Because most people aren't willing to pick a fight with someone who's very big and strong. Right, so that's a, that's a social thing that generally happens. Like, you don't see John Cena getting assaulted because he's a very large man. Or half Thor Bjornsson. You don't see him getting picked on because he is literally the strongest man in the world. He just broke the deadlift world record uh, lifting 500 kilograms. So that's over 1,100 pounds, right? People don't pick on big, strong people. So there's the peace through strength model that Ronald Reagan championed where we build up a very big, strong military, so people will generally, by and large, leave us alone, right? The other theory, sociologically, that's more along the lines of, again, we're not going to get philosophically into pacifism, but along those lines is the idea that building up a big military might invite conflict, where if we're building up a big military, we're, in essence, inviting or encouraging other nations around the world to increase their military spending with our military spending, and eventually we're going to butt heads, and when we do, we're going to have a whole lot of guns, a whole lot of bombs, a whole lot of planes, a whole lot of tanks, all to throw at one another, right? And that's going to cause a massive amount of casualties, and it's going to be very bad for the world. Those are two different camps, philosophically, that exist in America, and those would be polar opposites, basically. But part of the issue politically in a governmental system is trying to find balance where we're making a decision governmentally that the majority of people are on board with, or at least that is for the greater good for the most people, for the largest majority of people. So uh, your textbook gets into the idea of socializing people for war. 
which they get into more from a we've had we have a war very frequently. I mean, if you look at our history in America, you know, World War II, it's not very long. World War II ends in 1945. Korean War starts 1950, right? So we have another war. And then after that, we have Vietnam, right? And then after Vietnam, uh, we have the Persian Gulf War in the 90s, right? And then after the Persian Gulf War, we have the Afghan War, which is still going on. We have the Iraq War, which uh, didn't end until the 2010s, like 2011. The Iraq War ends uh, in 2011. Uh, so we have wars going on very frequently. And outside of wars, we also have conflicts. Like we had strategic bombing in Iraq before the Iraq War. Uh, we had strategic bombing uh, with Bosnia and Kosovo and all, all those issues under the Clinton administration. We had strategic bombing of terrorists under the Obama administration. Uh, so we see this. We also just had a recent where Donald Trump dropped a bomb on an Iranian general who was in Iraq stirring up uh, some terrorist activity. So we see warlike activity going on a re on a regular basis, and therefore we, we may become normalized uh, or we may become accustomed to it. So that, that's one theory, uh, and also as far as uh, socializing people for war, there are a lot of war movies and war video games, right, where people are used to seeing scenes of war, and so your book is making the sociological theory, it's presenting that the more exposure we have to warlike things, the more comfortable we are with war when it occurs. Um, although, in all fairness to the approach your book is taking, your book is coming from the approach that war is not a natural thing and that war is more from powerful political institutions pushing for it uh, than anything else. Then, like, So they would divorce themselves from the idea of interpersonal conflict being normal because we do see a lot of interpersonal conflict in the world. And they would say, forget about that. That has no bearing on war between nations. So uh, if we're looking at, from the book's perspective, they would say war is an anomaly. It only exists because big, powerful nations prepare people for it to happen, and then they make it happen. Uh, whereas a more holistic approach may be to say conflict is a general human condition, and even without governments being involved, people, even in small groups, often have interpersonal conflict. It, it may just be verbal. Right? It might not be, but interpersonal conflict is common. And when we add more people, the situation doesn't change. Personal or interpersonal conflict expands to larger groups as well. Um, and I mean, we see this, your book doesn't get into it, but we see this as part of human history. I mean, there are still tribal bush wars in Papua New Guinea where the culture is very different, but we have small tribes or small groups of people, small villages that have bush wars where they fight one another back and forth. It's not about a large, powerful government so much as people, groups, just not agreeing and taking the force of arms to solve their problem, or at least to prove that they're right, theoretically. So, the main point of the chapter, or at least this part of the chapter, is that a lot of money is spent on war, and a lot of governments push people at least to recognize the validity of their nation's war effort. So there, there is socialization for war. I mean, if you look at World War I and the CPI, the Committee on Public Information, uh, this happened in World War II as well. Uh, the government tries to get people behind the war effort. And it's a very wise and prudent thing for a government to do if they don't want their people to buck against the war. Uh, and we see where there wasn't as much of that during the Vietnam War and support for the war did wane. So governmentally, it's, it's a prudent thing to do for the government to socialize people toward war if they want the people to support the war effort. That does happen. Uh, so what I want you to get today, governments do push for war sometimes. They, governments fund the military um, and wars occur. And a lot of times governments socialize people to get on board with the war. They try to make it the cultural norm. And for people to be part of the majority in a culture, they must support the war effort. Right now, uh, that's not to say that, that the wars are unethical in any way, shape, or form. Right? Um, 
we can get into in coming days very brief discussions. I don't want to belabor the point of just war theory versus pacifism or anything like that. That's more for us a philosophy class or an ethics class. But political systems are a part of war. War is a part of being uh, a government, and it does occur. Funding is necessary for a military that can successfully fight a war, and generally governments push for propaganda for support of war efforts. So that's basically it for today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, keep up the solid work. You guys are doing a great job, and I'll talk to you again soon.